Shalom, and welcome to the Hebraic Roots Network. I am Valerie Moody of Hebrew Discovery Ministries. I have been a Hebrew Roots teacher for more than 10 years, and I love the God of Israel and Yeshua, my Messiah, just as Deuteronomy 6.5 tells me to, with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. Kol avav, kol nefesh, kol meod. I teach to create a deeper love of God. The Hebraic Roots Network is a team of many people. It's the vision of many Hebrew Roots teachers and the tireless efforts of a few precious servants of God. We are a network of people working together to teach you the way to our Heavenly Father and to His Messiah King. We can only do this as a team. You are part of that team. So please consider praying for the Hebraic Roots Network and send us a financial gift so that we can keep solid biblical teaching on the Internet. It is an honor to come to you today on behalf of the Hebraic Roots Network. Our teaching today is on Abraham or Abraham's new beginning with God. Abraham made a new beginning with God, and we want to see what he did and why he did it. Now, he crossed over from his homeland, and so he is the first Hebrew, which comes from the word Ivri, meaning to cross over. He crossed over and made a new beginning with God, and so we can really learn from what Abraham did. Abraham had to walk with God. He couldn't trust himself. He couldn't rely on himself. I mean, he was a solid guy. But God had asked him to do so many things that without God's help, God's guidance, God's direction, and God's support, he was never going to get to the mountain of Abraham. His journey was all about reaching the mountain of Abraham. Now, as he walked with God, he was tested. And most of us are tested in some way at some time or another when we choose to walk with God. If we decide to live by faith, we are people who will be tested. A heavenly t test is defined as, as one that forces a person to make a decision, to make a choice. They have to choose between God's will and their own natural tendencies. That's what a heavenly test is. A heavenly test means choosing between what God says is right over what our own understanding of what is right is. So we choose between God's perspective or our perspective and hopefully we choose God's perspective. This was the case with Abraham. He chose God's perspective. He suffered tests which God allowed him to experience, giving him an opportunity to choose how he would respond to those tests. If Abraham were to make a new beginning with God, he had to choose God's plan and his will, even in the trials that God brought him through. Now, the word for trials and testing, as we talked about last week, is the Hebrew word nasa, and that's Strong's Concordance number 5254. Nasa means to test, try, prove, tempt, and put to the proof or test. This was Abraham's experience when he walked with God. The first time the word nasa appears in Scripture is in Genesis 22, verse 1. Genesis 22, 1 says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And the word for tempt there is the word Nassah. Now, Abraham is the very first person in Scripture to experience a test from God. He is also the first person in Scripture to be called God's friend. Maybe there's a connection there. By his own testimony, he walked with God. Genesis 24:40 says, But he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. In this passage, Abraham was speaking to Eleazar. He was sending him off to Haran to get a son for his wife Isaac, or to get a wife for his son Isaac, and he said to Eleazar, The God before whom I walk is going to bless your mission. So Abraham was announcing to his servant Eleazar, I walk with God. I walk before God. And that God is going to give your mission 
success. Now, the word for walk in this particular verse is the word halak, and that's Strong's Concordance number 1980. This is where we get the word halaka. We've been talking a lot about halaka lately. Halaka is really the do's and don'ts of Scripture. In other words, halaka is living by Scripture, living by the Torah, and walking it out. So Abraham walked out the Torah in his relationship with God. We see this same word, halak, used when God appeared to him in Genesis 17.1. God said, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. And the word for walk in that verse is the word halak. What God was really saying was, show me your halakha, Abraham, I'm watching. Show me how you live the Torah and walk it out. So God was paying very close attention. Now, Abraham, in his halakha, or in his walk, made a new beginning with God. Abraham's new beginning involved his halakha, his walk, his journey to the mountain. How did he get to the mountain? Abraham showed us through his walk, or halakha, that faith has to be lived and walked out. Faith is lived in the same way that the more legal rulings of the Torah are lived. Abraham showed us Halakha, his fulfillment of the commandments and his walking a life of faith with God. God spoke favorably of Abraham's Halakha. God said in Genesis 26, 5, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. So Abraham's halakha fulfilled the Torah. This is what God is saying here, that Abraham did all these things. He kept his charge and his commandments. He kept his statutes and his Torah. So what God is analyzing here and talking about is Abraham's halakha. Abraham had a choice. He had a choice of deciding to do things his way or God's way. And he chose God's way and was tested ten times for it. These were the tests of Abraham. First, his first test, the, re, re, the rejection of the idol worship of his father. Now, Joshua 24.2 tells us that his father Terah, or Terak, as it's pronounced in Hebrew, the father of Abraham, served other gods and that he worshipped idols. In other words, Abraham's own father was not serving God or worshiping the God of heaven and earth. He served other gods and he worshiped idols. And that scripture refers to that. Abraham, in spite of this, had to respect his father. He had to respect the decisions his father was making because it was right for a, a son to respect a father. And so he was respecting a father even though he worshiped the other idols. This was a trial for Abraham. He didn't want to oppose him, um, and show disrespect in any way, but he could not accept the idol worship of his father. Now his second test was his persecution by Nimrod. Ancient traditional writings speak about Abraham's trial and conviction before Nimrod. He was severely persecuted before coming to the land of Canaan, and uh, much of that persecution was at the hand of in Nimrod. Those ancient stories tell of a time that Nimrod threw Abraham into a burning, fiery furnace because he would not worship idols or follow in the footsteps of his father, Terak, who worshipped idols and manufactured and sold idols, personal household idols, that people came to him and, and bought. Because Abraham wouldn't follow in his shoes, it angered, it infuriated Nimrod because Nimrod was the king of the monarchy that Abraham was born into. Nimrod is the first king in Scripture. Before Nimrod, there were no kings and no ruling monarchies in Scripture. This is the world Abraham was born into, and his refusal to follow those idols angered Nimrod. Now, his third trial was leaving his homeland in his father's house. Genesis 12, 7. 
Abraham was the very first person in Scripture whom God led to walk away from his family and become a stranger in another land. So that was a trial for him, actually leaving his homeland. When he first left, he didn't know where he was going. God simply said, I'll show you. Leave. Go out. Go out from your father. Let Laha leave and go fulfill your destiny. And I will show you the land where you are going. So Abraham had to prepare for that journey and actually uh, embark on that journey without actually knowing his destination. And that was a trial for him. Now, his fourth test was being tested with famine in the Promised Land. The reference is Genesis 12.10. This test was particularly perplexing, the test of the famine, because God sent him to the Promised Land with a promise and assurance of being blessed there. But when he got there, a severe famine drove him to Egypt temporarily. So it was a, it was a trial for him and one he really didn't understand. Now, his fifth trial was his wife, Sarah, or Sarai, as her name was at that time. Sarai was abducted by Pharaoh. The scripture reference is Genesis 12, 14, and 15. In Egypt, Abraham was victimized. When Pharaoh's officials took Sarai into the palace without Abraham's consent, they simply took her and put her in the palace to be part of uh, Pharaoh's harem, so to speak, and she would be available to Pharaoh there. They didn't ask Abraham's permission to do this. He was a victim of government-sponsored injustice. He had to depend on God. God had to rebuke. God does rebuke kings for the sake of his people, and he had to rebuke Pharaoh before Pharaoh would return Sarai to Abraham. This was Abraham's fifth trial. Now, going to war to save Lot was his sixth trial. The scripture reference is Genesis 14, 12 through 16. Lot chose the bright lights of Sodom as the place where he wanted to live. When enemy armies conquered Sodom, they took many captives and goods. They took people and their possessions with them, including Lot and his entire household. With only a few hundred servants, Abraham pursued the kings that came against Sodom, he fought them. He fought four armies with their kings. He risked the lives of his entire household trying to save his nephew Lot. Now, this was a man of peace who had to go to war to save his nephew. He put everything on the line. He risked everything to do this as a as an act of friendship or charity for Lot. And he was successful in that. God made him successful in that. But the act of going to war as a man of peace was Abraham's sixth trial. Now his seventh trial was his dreadful vision of slavery during the covenant between the parts in Genesis 15, 1 through 21. Entire books have been written about the covenant between the parts, so we are not going to talk much about that covenant today. We will in the future. This passage begins with Abraham calling God Adonai Yehovah, which is an unusual combination of divine names. Adonai comes from a word meaning master, husband, prophet, prince, and king. He is the very first person in scripture to call God Adonai. And that's Strong's Concordance number 136. And so during this covenant between the parts, Abraham is using this special name for God. And God is telling Abraham some pretty remarkable things about the harsh enslavement of his descendants. His descendants would become slaves. Now, God symbolized the darkness of that slavery when he cast darkness, sleep, and terror over Abraham during the covenant between the parts. They are in Genesis 15, 12. It's not easy to see our children suffer. And so this was very difficult. This was a trial for Abraham to learn this. It was a severe test to hear this news about the future enslavement and the bitter exile of his descendants. Now his eighth trial or test was the painful circumcision he underwent at the age of 99. The scripture reference is Genesis 17, 10 through 23. 
The covenant between the parts was contingent on Abraham becoming circumcised. So Abraham actually had to undergo a surgical procedure. The physical act of being circumcised was Abraham's part of the covenant, but it was also a sign of the covenant's deeper meaning. Let's think about this for a minute. The orla, which is translated as foreskin usually, is considered to be a type of barrier between God and a holy lifestyle. Now, Abraham was circumcised at the age of 99 to remove the barrier between him and God's holy promises in the covenant between the parts. So that is why the covenant of circumcision came during the covenant between the parts. Now, in Hebrew thinking, every commandment has two parts. First is the action of actually fulfilling the commandment. Section, or second, rather, is the underlying spiritual principle. First is the act of actually doing it. Second is the underlying spiritual principle. Neither actions nor principles are complete. Neither one are complete without the other. It takes actions to fulfill principles, and it takes principles behind the actions. That's what we read in James 2.20. The idea of being circumcised at the age of 99, it was a very painful for Abraham, a surgical procedure, and this was his eighth test or trial. His ninth test was un, uh, the ongoing family problems that he was experiencing, the infertility of Sarai, his wife, Lot's ingratitude and his departure from Abraham, and the eviction of Hagar and Ishmael. When his son Isaac was born, Sarah insisted that Abraham send them away and cast them out into the desert. These were all challenges for him. And so his ninth trial or test was really a series of tests, and and they were all related to these family issues of Sarai's infertility, Lot's ingratitude, and the eviction of Hagar and Ishmael. So Abraham was struggling daily with with Sarai's infertility, and he and his wife were old. They were unable to conceive, even though God had promised to make their descendants very numerous, and so this this was difficult. Um, Then Lot expressed his ingratitude toward Abraham's continuous care for him by moving away from him. Finally, Abraham had to evict Hagar and Ishmael. Sarah originally believed that Hagar, her Egyptian handmaiden, would build Abraham and Sarah's house by bearing children for them. Sarah used the verb banah, which is the Hebrew, uh, which is Strong's Concordance number 1129, and it means to build a house. So she actually thought that when Hagar had children, that she would build their house. Now, Sarah was driven by fear after she gave birth to Isaac. She told Abraham, send Hagar away with her son. We know Sarah's true concerns. We know she was fearful because of the specific Hebrew word she spoke in Genesis 21.10. She told Abraham, cast out this handmaid and her son, for the son of this handmaid will not be an heir, a Yerash, with my son, even with Isaac. Now, in English, it sounds like Sarah is jealous of Ishmael, and she wants all the inheritance for Isaac. She doesn't want the inheritance to be split between two sons. But in Hebrew, a new meaning emerges. When Sarah said that Ishmael would not be an heir, she should have used the word Nahal, which is Strong's Concordance number 5157. The Nahal means to divide an inheritance equally. If that's what she was afraid of, that's the word she would have used. But that is not the word she used in that verse. Instead, she used the word Yerash, which is Strong's Concordance number 3423. And the two are are really not even related, except that they're both connected to an inheritance. One, the first, Nahal, is to divide an inheritance equally. But your rash means to dispossess someone, to steal all the inheritance from them, and to cause others to be impoverished and, and destroyed. She believed that Ishmael would do this to Isaac. 
So her real concern was not that the inheritance would be divided equally. If that were the case, she would have used that word Nahal. Instead, Sarah was concerned that Ishmael would seize all of the inheritance as an older brother and completely dispossess Isaac, as indicated by the word that she used, which was the word Yerash. Now, Abraham was distressed when he had to send Hagar and Ishmael into the desert with limited provisions. However, as in every trial, Abraham did not put off what he had to do. He did not postpone the inevitable. He rose early in the morning to send them away, even though he dreaded their departure. This was Abraham's ninth trial. Abraham's tenth trial was the commandment to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah or Mount Moriah as a burnt offering, as a as an olah. The scripture references Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. The final trial was Abraham's most terrible trial. Genesis 22, 2 says, Now take your son, your only son whom you love, even Isaac, and go into the land, into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for an Allah, a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Incredibly, God wanted Abraham to offer up his son as an Allah. And Allah is Strong's Concordance number 5930. It's, it means a whole burnt offering. And Allah was a specific type of sacrifice. Some offerings in the book of Leviticus are only partly burned on the altar, and then the worshipers eat the remainder of these offerings. But the Allah, the whole burnt offering, was completely consumed on the altar. The word Allah is connected to the Hebrew word for ascent. In offering his son, Abraham would be ascending to a higher level of testing and a higher level of trust in God. Isaac was Abraham's only future. If he were to become an Allah or whole burnt offering, Isaac would die and there would be no descendants to occupy the promised land. Isaac did not have children at this point. He was not married. Isaac was Abraham's only future. In Isaac, all the promises of God to Abraham found their focus. Yet Abraham was willing to sacrifice his future to God. Considering the full import of the word Olah, we realize that it was not Isaac's blood that God wanted. God wanted Isaac's very life. He wanted everything that he was or ever could be. Isaac became an example of total submission to God and to his laws, teachings, and instructions in the Torah. The Olah of Isaac is, of course, a picture of Yeshua. God told Abraham, to offer his son completely. God offered his son Yeshua completely as well. So in this picture of making Isaac and Olah, we see Yeshua. For believers in Yeshua, we see Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac as a picture of the sacrificed Messiah in the pages of the Torah. And that's pretty exciting when we find Yeshua in the Torah. Now from this example we can learn that all believers are called to be like Isaac. We are all called to be an Olah or a whole burnt offering. We have been crucified or burned up with the Messiah. That's what Galatians 2.20 tells us. It is no longer we who live, but the Messiah living in us. We are sacrificed with the Messiah. We have become an Olah. We give everything to God. And so this was Abraham's tenth and final test. It was the most dramatic and traumatic event of Abraham's life. But he made a new beginning with God. And that new beginning included this very traumatic trial. It was God's commandment to sacrifice the son of his old age. Making an Allah of his son Isaac was Abraham's last and greatest trial. Most of us will never suffer trials like these. Our everyday lives may be stressful, but we are seldom called upon by God to endure these tests. When we are tested, 
many of us become angry with God. Some people react to trials negatively and they want nothing more to do with God. Some believe that it doesn't seem worth it somehow. They ask, why devote my life to God to serve Him if He is going to allow bad things to happen to me? They connect their personal negative experiences with God and they blame Him for them. Now, we learn lessons from Abraham's trials. In these trials, he's making a new beginning. So we learn even more about the fact that he made a new beginning with God. We learn from his new beginning and from his halakha, how he walked. He walked out the Torah. God does not directly test very many people, but he did test Abraham. And he may test us. Now let's look at a couple of people in Scripture that went through tests but they were not directly tested by God. He did not test Joseph, for instance, but he allowed Joseph to be tested and refined through his trying experiences. Joseph was tested through the hatred of his brothers. He was tested when his brothers sold him into slavery. He was tested in the house of Potiphar. He was tested in an Egyptian prison where he was incarcerated for a crime he did not commit. God allowed Joseph to be tested by these painful trials. Joseph emerged from his trials worthy to be a great leader of two nations, a leader of Egypt and a leader of Israel. And that's what he was. So God did not directly test Joseph, but he allowed Joseph to be tested. Now, God did not directly test Job either, but God allowed Job to be tried and tested by Hasatan or Satan. He gave Satan permission to sorely try Job. Job experienced the loss of all his wealth. The de- he suffered the death of all of his children. He endured painful sores afflicting his entire body from top to bottom, head, head to the sole of his feet. And it all happened all at once. Yet Job was proven faithful by these trials and is now the primary example in Scripture of someone tested by God who emerged with a brighter future as a result of these tests. Unlike Joseph and Job, God directly tested Abraham. In his fiery trials, Abraham could have gone back to his homeland. He could have thrown in the towel and said, that's it. He could have returned to his father's house. He had a career waiting for him there, a career manufacturing and selling idols, as his father Terak did. He could have rejoined the family bu- this family business of idol making, but he chose to stay with God, to love God and to serve him. He made God his complete source of provision. God was his source of provision, instruction, and guidance. And he chose to make God that person, that leader, that God in his life. So in spite of his trials, Abraham chose to have a new beginning with God. Our Hebraic studies provide insight into Abraham. When Abraham faced trials, he rose early in the morning to do what God asked him to do. Because Abraham rose early in the morning, the the sages connect Abraham with the morning prayer service. In other words, the Shemoni Esri, or the Amidah, is tied to Abraham. Abraham rose early in the morning, so the morning prayer service belongs to this patriarch of the Hebrews. The prayer begins reverently by blessing God with a title that includes Abraham's name. It says, O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O God, Shield of Abraham. Abraham chose to follow the shield of Abraham. He chose a new beginning with the God who was his shield. Abraham was alone in his walk, or halakha. He was the first. He didn't have anyone else to show him how to do this. There was no tradition of revelation about God to guide him in his quest. Abraham had no alternative 
but to begin his search by contemplating the world that he could see with his own eyes, the stars and the planets and all the other hosts of creation. Abraham is reputed to have been one of the most outstanding students of nature that ever lived, especially of the planets and stars. In Genesis 15.5, it records that God took Abraham outside to look up at the heavens and count the stars. When God took him outside, he raised Abraham to a level of perception that lay beyond the astronomy which he had already mastered. After all, Abraham had grown up in the Babylonian culture. There, the sages and the priests were expert sky gazers and star worshippers, and Abraham was taught to believe that the planets and the stars rule over all that takes place on the earth. So Abraham knew the skies as well as anyone. He had no doubt that the stars and the planets influenced everything on earth, yet his driving urge was to find Elohim, the ultimate power and source of all things. When he found him, he understood that everything that we can see in this world derives from God and is a teaching to us about God. Our world teaches us about God. Often children will inherit their potential for physical, mental, and spiritual growth from their parents. But this is not true in Abraham's case, since his father was an idol worshiper. Abraham did not inherit his spiritual potential from anyone. The sages teach that he climbed alone to a new pinnacle of spirituality. On his own, he tried to form a spiritual bond, a powerful bond with God. He made a new beginning with God. This was the reason that God finally commanded Abraham to depart from his homeland, to sever all ties with his past and with his loved ones, and to follow his voice. Abraham had formed a bond with him and made a new beginning with God. Abraham never had a teacher. He began his life before the Torah. God's teachings and instructions were actually written. Since he was the first, he was guided through the yearnings of his heart. Abraham was a spiritual pioneer. He was the only one in his generation who was seeking God. The end goal and purpose, of course, was to reach the mountain of Abraham and to build the house, the place where mankind could ultimately serve God. Abraham was the first one in this journey to the mountain, and he was the first one to hew the stones out of the mountain to build God's house. Now, Abraham saw the kingdom of God. How do we know? Yeshua said in John 8:56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Well, Yeshua ushered in the kingdom of God. He came teaching about the kingdom of God and showing people the way to the kingdom of God. And what he told us about Abraham was that Abraham saw that day and he rejoiced in it. So Abraham saw the kingdom of God. Abraham's new beginning was more than a new beginning for just one person. It was a new beginning for everyone in the kingdom of God. It was a new way for all mankind. His walk with God marked the end of the era of desolation and the beginning of the era of Torah. In Hebraic understanding, the first 2,000 years of creation were the era of desolation. They were years of rampant sin and unbridled idolatry, the devastating flood, and the building of the Tower of Babel. The second 2,000 years were the era of the Torah, with Abraham, who was born in the Hebrew year 1948 from creation, God began to influence people to serve him. He began to usher in the era of Torah beginning with Abraham. The plan of creation was for all human beings to share equally in fulfilling God's divine mission of keeping the commandments and doing his will. So God had a divine mission for mankind, but he started with Abraham and Abraham's new beginning. Now man on his own, failed to follow this mission. For 20 generations, they failed. 
Avraham was a new beginning. He just demonstrated a, a new halakha, a new way of living and walking by the Torah. He followed God's teachings and instructions. Genesis 26.5 says, Avraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. According to this verse, Avraham lived the Torah before the Torah was written down because God had written it on his heart. When Avraham made a new beginning with God, God wrote the Torah on his heart. The Torah was God's code of wisdom. The Torah became Avraham's set of instructions for how to walk. It was his instructions for his halakha, and it formed the guidelines for Avraham's descendants. Now, with God's instructions, Avraham could begin to repair the damage that was done in the era of desolation. He could begin to repair the world. It's a concept which is known in Hebrew as tikkun olam, repairing the world. The Torah would help the people of the entire world focus on the wisdom and the glory of God. So this was the beginning. Avraham's new beginning was a new beginning for all of mankind. The world's repair and restoration began with Avraham's new beginning with God. Now, Avraham was that new beginning. He showed others how to journey with God, how to walk with God. He showed others what halakha looks like. He showed us how to be one of God's chosen people. Since the time of Abraham, the privilege of being God's chosen people belongs to his descendants and to those who follow him in faith. Now, all nations are blessed through Abraham, as Genesis 12.3 explains. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham and his descendants are God's chosen people. Now, Galatians expresses this relationship in this way. Know therefore that they which are of faith, the same as, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. That's Galatians 3, 7 through 9. We are blessed because of Abraham's new beginning. That is, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus, the Messiah, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's Galatians 3.14. So you see, twice here in Galatians 3, we are learning that uh, that Abraham was justified through his halakha and how he walked, and that as believers we are justified by his example and by our faith. We are heirs through Abraham's new beginning. It says, And if you be Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's Galatians 3.29. We have an inheritance because of Abraham's new beginning with God. Now, God's chosen people are Abraham's seed. These are his natural descendants, the Hebrew people. The chosen people are also his spiritual descendants, and that's those of us who follow Yeshua. Abraham's descendants are God's chosen people because they follow his example of faith through trials and testing. They start a new beginning with God, just as Abraham did, and they do it through their belief and through their faith. Now, Abraham was not tested by an act of kindness. He was not challenged by helping the needy or a test like that, since this was something that he normally did. He's known for his charity, his kindness, and his hospitality. So that wouldn't have tested him. However, he was sorely tested and tried when it came to deserting his homeland. And he suffered greatly when he was asked to give his cherished, beloved son as an Olah, or a whole burnt offering. Abraham was tested and passed those tests 
because he was involved in a new beginning with God. He demonstrated his conviction that man's highest goal is to accept God's divine wisdom as the sole truth. One sage said that God tests only righteous people who will do his will. He doesn't test the wicked people who will disobey. Abraham's trials were designed to display his obedience. They were designed to show the world how a great man obeys God and how he walks, what his halakha looks like even when he's walking alone. Now, what qualities did he need to reach the mountain? Through the tests of his faith, Abraham began to, uh, God began to build in Abraham several qualities that he needed to reach the mountain. Understanding, wisdom, humility, and kindness were some of the qualities necessary to journey to the mountain of Abraham, to journey with God. Abraham had understanding, which is the spiritual quality of Binah, Strong's Concordance number 998. He studied and understood the natural world around him and God's role as the creator. So he had understanding of the world. Now we see the word benah in 1 Chronicles 12.32. It says, Of the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their kinsmen were at their command. And the word for these sons of Issachar who understood the times is the word Bana. This is a, a character trait that Abraham had as well. And he needed it to journey with God. He needed it to reach the mountain of Abraham. He needed it for his halakha, his walk with God. We know that Abraham showed an, a second spiritual quality, and this was the quality of wisdom or Kukma in Hebrew. With wisdom, Abraham saw the futility of Chaldean society and he saw God on his own. When Abraham could not find a righteous person in Ur of the Chaldees, he had the wisdom to search for a creator God. Hukma is Strong's Concordance number 2451. It is, the, it is wisdom that is working with the attribute of understanding. Now, the idea of wisdom and understanding, or understanding and wisdom, is this, that these are two of the seven spirits of God that are mentioned in Isaiah 11.2. This verse says, The spirit of Jehovah shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, or hukmah, the spirit of understanding, or binah, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Abraham had these qualities, both wisdom and understanding. Abraham also had the quality of humility. Humility is really the true foundation of wisdom. Humility is the Hebrew word anah, Strong's Concordance number 6031. Anah means to be humbled by voluntarily kneeling. So humility is like a mountain because uh, because meekness and lowliness, the idea of kneeling, are really the highest of all spiritual qualities. We see the word anah in Daniel 10:12. It says, Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before God, Your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. So Daniel's humbling was this word, Anah. The fourth quality that Avraham needed to journey to the mountain with God was the attribute of Hesed. And this is Strong's Concordance number 2617. We know this as the attribute of kindness. The idea with Hesed is not only kindness, but a willingness to be reproached and ashamed. Now that's very interested, uh, very interesting because Hesed is more than kindness. It's the idea of one serving another by humbling themselves before that person. With Hesed or kindness, one willingly serves another. Avraham displayed Hesed when he risked everything to save his nephew Lot. 
chesed involves the idea of rescue, as a matter of fact. And that's why we know his action of going to war to save his nephew Lot was an act of charity or chesed. Psalm 44:26 says, Rise up, be our help, and redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness. And the word there is the word chesed. So the idea of rescue is involved in this word for kindness. Abraham was showing kindness when he went to battle to save Lot. Now, what have we learned about Abraham's new beginning today? He had a tremendous new beginning. It caused him to be called God's friend. He is the only one in Scripture who's known as God's friend. It also caused him to become the father of faith, the Yavah Shel Emunah, the father of our faith. God tested Abraham, and he emerged stronger as a result of his faith. He is an example of how we are to react to everyday stress and to even extraordinary stress or events that test us. We learn to trust God and make a new beginning. That's what Abraham did. He placed his world in God's control when he made a new beginning and chose to walk with God. His decision was a decision to have a halakha or a walk that would follow the Torah, God's every commandment, God's every word, his statutes, and his precepts. That's what Abraham embraced. God walked him through every test, and he will walk us through every test as well, if that is our decision. We learned that Abraham manifested the spiritual qualities of understanding, wisdom, humility, and kindness. The na, hukma, ana, and chesed. In his halakha, or in his walk, This is what he had, this is what he showed, this is what he demonstrated. These qualities assisted him in his new beginning with God and in his journey to God's mountain. We become keenly aware of Abraham's new beginning when we travel to Israel. In northern Israel, in Jerusalem, and in the Negev desert, we stand where Abraham stood. We take travelers to authentic biblical sites. It is a great benefit to actually be in the very places where the great stories of Scripture took place. We learn more about the God of Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel, and the Torah of Israel, beginning with Abraham. We should naturally be curious about Israel. After all, that is where it all happened. To hang on to the promised land, The children of Israel had to journey in faith. Why was faith necessary for them? Well, they were smaller than all the surrounding nations, and they still are today. But God was and is Israel's defender. We are encouraged in our own faith when we visit Israel. In our own stature or power, we may seem small, yet God is our defender just as he is Israel's defender. Now, our tours to Israel give you insight about God in the land of Abraham. He protects this amazing land, and he protects us as well. We enjoy a fabulous tour of all the major sites in Israel, including the Golden City of Jerusalem, the city of Melchizedek. We go to all the important sites around the Sea of Galilee, and we stop at Tel Dan to repent for the sins of Jeroboam on the soil where Jeroboam's sins occurred. From Dan to Beersheba, we walk in biblical sites. The teachings are phenomenal, and we supplement all those teachings on the tour with a comprehensive four-color guidebook that our travelers get to keep. My purpose in taking you to Israel is to provide you with a fabulous experience that that draws you closer to the God of Israel and the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Yeshua, our Messiah. So Israel shows us the God of Abraham, and it also shows us the Messiah of Abraham. 
I also want you to know about the people of Israel, especially the Messianic Jewish believers, because those who have met Yeshua are often fired from their jobs. Israel can persecute those new Israeli believers. They like Christians, but they don't like their own when they become believers in Yeshua, the Messiah. Often they'll be fired from their jobs and unable to support their families. Some have even been the subject of violence from extra-zealous people in Israel. We meet these believers and we bring them comfort. Now, comfort for these needy families is something that our congregation tries to do year-round. It's something that we do every month. Please let me know if you want to join us in that good work. But when we go to Israel, we have a chance to meet them in person and bring them encouragement. And so it's wonderful to actually go to the land of Avraham and comfort his descendants there. We ourselves are spiritual heirs of Avraham, spiritual descendants of Avraham. We have made a new beginning because Avraham made a new beginning. So please come to Israel with me. Visit my website, www.israeldiscoverytour.com to learn more about the upcoming 2012 tour to Israel. It is the land of Avraham and the land of Yeshua. I'm also inviting you back to join me next week as we continue journeying toward the mountain of Avraham. God took him on this journey. He showed him how to walk. And God shows us how to walk through the new beginning that Avraham made with God.